Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here with you, and I'm really jazzed to talk about protein and how much protein is best for easy weight loss. You know, this isn't a topic that's been a critical one for me. Uh, there's, there's a range in how much protein people need and how much protein they do well with, and I've come to learn that I'm at a more extreme part of that range. You know, I, I've talked about gaining weight as a child and how I, I did lose that weight by uh, eating well and exercising and, and getting more physically active. And it was a bit of a struggle to overcome some of the complications of cerebral palsy, but the lifestyle changes helped with that. Well, there's another phase to it. There's been a couple of phases to it. Um, one phase was as a teenager in my late, late high school, yeah, high school years, I became pretty sedentary again and started slipping away from my good eating habits and I, I gained a fair amount of weight. And I, I went back and got serious about studying nutrition books. There was a lot of books that talked at that time about, uh, there was Fit for Life was out then, and I went deep into it, and that was one of a, a more raw food-based diet. And what happened to me was that I was consuming very clean, very good foods, I was trying to be active, but my appetite was insatiable. I was just always hungry, I never got enough food. And I would use iron discipline to stay to a narrow list of the healthy approved foods, but I couldn't get enough. And I was not moving the right way in terms of my body weight. So it was only when I started realizing about the importance of protein and adding some quality protein back in that I could get filled up. <laughs> I could have energy growth and muscle mass back, but just get a rein in on the appetite. And that was a powerful experience. And over the years, I've had times to where I've been, uh, I've always been really simpatico or, or connected with the idea of the ethical arguments of veganism and the environmental arguments of veganism. I completely resonate with all of that. You know, I would love to not need to harm anything to live, and I would love to need to have less of an environmental impact to live. I, it lights me up. But whenever my protein intake goes below mm, 20, 25 percent calories even, I'm just hungry nonstop, and there's no amount of carb or fat in the world that ever stops it. <laughs> so studies have shown that I'm not alone and this happens. So let's go deep in protein and talk about this. Something we hear a lot is that we don't really need all that much protein, that you really can't get a protein deficiency, and that people get consumed so much more than they need. Well, yes and no. So let's think about what is a protein deficiency. There's a couple things that are known medically. There's kwashiorkor and there's protein calorie malnutrition. And these are real, they're tragic, they're not things that occur in the modern world. Now, it, it's, it's a different phenomena to prevent a deficiency than it is to have an optimal amount. I think we, we, I think we get this with vitamin C, for example. You know, just a speck of vitamin C can keep you from getting scurvy. You know, even just having some lemons or limes on the boat on occasion in your water, you won't get scurvy. But you can be well below your optimal vitamin C intake. And the same thing is true for protein. Yes, small amounts can offset protein calorie malnutrition and quash your core. And by and large, if you're getting enough food calories from almost any food imaginable, you're not going to get those deficiency diseases. But that's not the same as protein in terms of ideal energy, body composition, food cravings, all those sorts of things. They're different ideas. So what foods have protein? Well, pretty much everything has some. Some foods have more than others. We're going to get a little bit more granular, but big picture, we think about protein being in meat, fish, poultry, pork, dairy foods, eggs, egg whites, soy foods, protein powders, beans, legumes, nuts, seeds, they contain that as well, seafood, shellfish, some grains, things like quinoa or amaranth or oats, they've got, they've got more protein. But that's relevant in terms of offsetting protein deficiency. So even potatoes, for example, if you've got enough of those, you're probably not going to get a protein deficiency. So the ideal amounts of protein for more so good body composition, easier weight loss, more controlled appetite, that's not so much just that minimum daily requirement. <clears throat> that's more so how much protein you get compared to your total caloric intake or protein per calorie. And very different concept. You can have plenty of grams of protein, but still have very little protein per calorie, if that makes sense. So you wouldn't be deficient, but you're getting so many other calories that protein may not have its optimal effects in terms of your body weight. 
So we've seen this relevant for body weight, but also for diabetes, heart disease, you know, response to cardiovascular training, all those things are relevant. So how do you know how much protein you get in terms of percent calories? Well, that's a function of just gauging grams of protein and total calories. So it seems that somewhere around 25 to 35% is the magic spot for, for good body response. And protein is less dense in calories than fat is, and probably less dense in carbs once you figure out how it works on metabolism. But for easy math, you can think about roughly five calories per gram for protein. So if you've got a 2,000 calorie diet that you've consumed, and you've had 50 grams of protein, well, let's make it even easier. Say you've had like uh, 40 grams of protein. So that's 200 calories of protein. And out of 2,000, that's 10% protein calories. So that's that. There was a big study, one of the larger ones, called the Diogenes study. This is pretty neat because it was uh, done throughout a large amount of Europe, and it was also randomized and controlled. So they had people on different diets, and they watched in terms of how these various diets affected weight loss, but also weight regain afterwards. And this went on for many months, so it had a lot of power to it, and it was well regulated. What they saw from this was that those on the higher protein diet um, did better in all the important ways, but also they had a lower dropout rate. They had an easier time sticking with it. Um, and also they had a better time in terms of just body composition shifts as well. And, and we see this. So protein calories, again, they're, they're often more filling and your appetite is diminished. Other papers have shown that if you substitute calories for protein calories, you'll consume less food afterward than you would if you'd have substituted those same calories for fat or for carbohydrate. So protein has a unique effect upon really offsetting appetite that's not found as much in other nutrients. And there's a point where you can get too much, and that's probably somewhere above 40% or more. There's just questions about that. But by any, by any guidelines, that 25 to 30% ratio is safe and effective. So I talked about the overall foods that have protein. So what about the foods that are dense in protein? Well, it's a similar list. We've got the meat, fish, pork, uh, we've got poultry to think about. Uh, we've got seafood, shellfish, eggs, eggs whites. Now dairy foods, there's only two, and that's gonna be cottage cheese and non-fat unsweetened Greek yogurt. And this is not a blanket endorsement. There are many that need to avoid dairy foods because of casein or other issues like that. But those are the only two that are high amounts of protein per calorie. The other thing lost on this list would be beans and seeds and uh, cheeses and also nuts. So those are all foods that have protein, but there's not as much protein per calorie. You know, beans are good foods, they're a good carb. Nuts and seeds are good foods, they're a good fat. Don't think of them as much as protein. So the only other foods that really have that dense amount of protein per calorie would be soy foods and protein powder. And that's, that's what's been the wrinkle for me with vegan or vegetarian plans is that you can have so many good healthy foods, but the drawback is that unless you're doing large amounts of protein powder or large amounts of soy food, and by large amounts I mean like with every meal, there's no way you can have a high amount of protein per calorie. So yes, you can offset the deficiency, but you won't have a lot of protein per calorie. And the drawback is that for a lot of us, we're just not gonna be full. We're gonna end up consuming more food than we need and end up paradoxically gaining weight and feeling less, less energized and not recover as effectively. So, <laughs> and they've also shown too that protein has a larger effect upon satiety than either carbohydrate or high fat meals. And this is for that meal, but also for the follow-up meals as well. Your just hunger is, is diminished, you've got more satiety. The other benefits are that protein foods boost metabolic rate. So your body is warmer. Your body is generating more energy from just consuming protein. You've got to burn calories to process protein. And then protein also passively affects body composition. So one study I saw that was fascinating, it showed that they, they took groups of people and they put them on three diets. And they controlled calorie intake, but also they controlled protein content. And what they showed that one group was put on higher protein, roughly 30% calories, 
One was on a typical American diet, which is about 10 to 12% protein, not really all that much. You know, Americans often have a lot of burgers or whatnot. Those are actually not high protein foods. Those are more so high fat foods. So yeah, high protein, standard American, then more of a low protein, seven to 10%. That's, that's more of a restrictive vegan or restrictive vegetarian low protein diet. And they watched changes in body weight and changes in body composition. Now, the, the interesting thing about the study I'm referring to is that they overfed everyone on purpose. So people had a thousand calories more than they probably needed each day. And they all gained weight, but they gained different kinds of weight. So the low protein group, they gained more fat and they actually lost muscle as they were gaining weight, which was, which was surprising. The moderate protein group, the American type group, they gained a lot of fat, they gained a little bit of muscle, but the high protein group, they gained almost exclusively muscle mass. So they may not have looked worse. <laughs> they put on weight, but they may have had just better contour and better shaping because of that. So it's a big factor. And the other thought is that those amounts, that 25 to 35% range, that's not something you fall into by mistake. You know, you can easily go high carb or high fat, but to go really higher protein, that does take a bit more thought and planning. You know, that really is having a quality, dense source of protein, often a shake for breakfast, having good versions throughout the day with each of your meals, and then possibly having even another shake at some point throughout the day. So without that, you won't be at that high range, that 25 to 35% mark. So easy to do and yeah, it makes a big difference on just reducing overall cravings and helping energy, helping exercise recovery and all those good shifts on body composition. So Dr. Christensen here with you and make sense out of your protein and hopefully you've got that at a good range or you can improve it. You know, an easy trick to, to know where you are too is just try tracking it for a little bit. Um, I like using MyFitnessPal and you can quickly see what percent you've got of protein, fat, and carb and then make accordingly adjustments. But take great care and we'll talk in really soon. Bye-bye.